So my name is Catherine Massell, and I currently live in Austin, Texas. I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, and moved away when it was time for college. Um, I've lived a lot of places, and so far I'm delighted. I've had a very eventful life, and it's been exciting, but nothing really compares to the experience that I'm going to share with you today. For me, that was one of the most meaningful moments that I've ever experienced. So the experience that I had happened in a suburb of New Orleans, Louisiana. It was Metairie, and that's where I was growing up as a child. It was a Monday morning when school was canceled. There was a hurricane that had gone through over the weekend, and that's pretty common in New Orleans. And we got word early Monday morning that school was going to be canceled. I'm the youngest of eight children, so... I was seven years old at the time, and the oldest child was 11 years older than me. So all of these kids were excited that school had been canceled. So it was like, you know, woo, another day of summer happening. So one of my brothers, who was four years older than me, we jumped on a bicycle and I was on the handlebars and we rode to our local convenience store, like we typically did so many times that summer. And it was a beautiful kind of after storm, like rainbow type of um, day, looking for rainbows, kind of cloudy, kind of sunny. Uh, we went to the convenience store and that I remember pretty well like I remember most memories what I'm about to tell you I remember like it was yesterday so I remember leaving the convenience store and I don't remember the accident but we were hit by a young teenage driver who was doing 60 miles an hour and hit us doing 60 and our bodies were thrown more like 20 feet they found our, my shoes far away but what I remember was suddenly being above my body, floating above, kind of facing down. And the height would have been about the height of the top of telephone poles. We were outside. That's kind of about how it felt. I was looking down and I saw this mangled little blonde haired girl. And it was surprising that I saw that it was me. And I was looking at me and the scene and the whole scene as if I was watching a movie, literally. If you've ever been to a movie and then went back home, the space that I was looking down at my body was a place that I had been before, and it's a place that I believe that I will be again. And I was watching almost like a movie. Behind me, I never turned around, but behind me was an essence of love and light. And it was a, I'm going to say being for lack of a better word, but it was a being that if I were to describe it, it would be like a God or a Jesus because, you know, I was born and raised Catholic, but it was this loving being that was behind me over my shoulder watching with me. And there was colorful light emanating from behind me. I never turned around to look at it, but it looked like the scene I was looking at was almost black and white in comparison to the light that was shining behind me. And I'm watching this child. And at that moment, there was a gentleman that was kneeling over me. This was 1974, so it was a long time ago. And the guy was in style, he had curly hair and a mustache, kind of like um, Sonny Bono from Sonny and Cher. He had bell-bottom jeans on and he was kneeling and hands over my body and he had never seen anything like this. He was, this is what I was feeling from him. He was devastated. This was the most traumatic moment he'd ever seen in his life. And he didn't know what to do for me, but I could feel his empathy and I could feel his thoughts. He didn't know if he should pray. He didn't know if he should start CPR. He was thinking of blowing in my mouth. I could hear his thoughts as if, you know, I, I was reading his mind and the ground around my head, everything that I saw was so detailed. Like I could see the little shadow of the pebbles that I remember thinking the sun would shine differently. It would look a little different because the shadows from the pebbles. I actually saw the blood that was pulled around my head. It's almost like a living essence. And none of this was traumatic to me. I was not in pain or anything, but I remember feeling for this guy who wanted to help me so badly. And he just was there for me waiting for some type of you know, EMS to arrive. And then I wondered, like, what happened to me, like this little girl? And immediately with my thoughts, because I thought that I was shifted over to a young girl, long hair, like they had in the seventies, kind of like a Barbie doll. She was leaning over the hood of the car and she was crying. Like, you know, she was in so much trouble. She felt bad because she just hit two children. She was in her teens, but I don't know the exact details, but she wasn't supposed to be driving the car that day or she wasn't supposed to be speeding she was going to be in so much trouble for this and she felt 
terrible and she was worried. So she was the person who had hit us. And then I could hear someone talking to my sister. My sister's name was Terry. She's seven years older than me. I had three older brothers and then my sister and then three more boys and then a girl. There were eight kids in my family. So I could hear my sister was my hero at that time. We shared a room together. She was my protector. I was her little, you know, girl that, you know, she wanted a sister so bad because she had so many brothers. I could hear her in the distance. People were saying, go to her. She's calling you. And I could see this little girl's mangled body. My leg was bent backwards. I could see my lips moving, but I don't recall what I was saying. But apparently I was calling for her. So immediately when I thought of my sister, it panned me over to her. And what I saw of my sister was remarkable. What I saw of my sister at that moment when I was calling to her, she was saying to the group of girls around her, I can't go to her. It was too much for her. My sister was my mother's helper and she had a huge responsibility. She helped take care of all the boys. She helped to clean up and do all of the things. And the responsibility that she was given at that age was too much for her. I saw her at private schools that our parents sent us to, but my parents were struggling to make you know ends meet at that time. And the shame she felt from having to wear used clothing, private school with uniforms, the shame that she felt from having brothers that were kind of mean to her and everybody knew them. Think of like the Dukes of Hazard, some Southern boys that were pretty bad, but she was very much a rule follower. And I just saw this guilt of her. I saw a guilt that she carried with her from being in this role that she had. And I saw resentment that she had towards me because I was the youngest and I didn't have to do laundry or dishes or anything. I was too small to do that. And it was as if she was fighting a battle that didn't exist. She took it on much more seriously than maybe she should have. And it was eye-opening to me because if she would have just told me that, which she never ever mentioned, then I would have just thought like, you know, I'm sorry, I can't really too bad for you kind of thing, but I felt how she felt. And because of that, I've always had an unconditional love for my sister because I know what she went through and how hard that is. As we got older, we probably would have gone separate ways. We have different lives. But because of that, I always have and always will have unconditional love for my sister. She couldn't come to me then because it was too much for the life that she had been living thus far. She was always afraid that one of my brothers or someone was going to die because they were bad doing, you know, whatever, you know, boys do. And here she was at that moment when her little sister might be dying and she couldn't go to me. At that moment, I wondered, where's my mom? And when I thought that, I sh shifted right over to my mother. It was as if my thoughts were directing me to where I could go, what I could see, what I could feel. And there was my mother who was 35 years old, the mother of eight kids. She was my hero until this point, every day of my life. When I woke up in the morning, my mom was awake. And every night when I went to bed, my mother was, all, she was awake. I've never seen my mom sleep. I've never seen her wearing pajamas. She was busy. Busy and she was doing the best job you could even imagine taking care of eight kids. She was incredible. So I saw her. And when I saw my mother, I saw things that there's nothing that a child my age could have known. I saw the shame that she went through from having a, a child so young. I don't know if she had finished high school and the family members that were involved with her, you know, marrying my dad may or may not have been all that happy about her her getting married at such a, long, a young age, or maybe it just wasn't a complete acceptance of her. I saw her as a child. She was raised by an uncle and I never questioned it, but there were questionable things in her background of who she was. And then I, I was shown, and I'm watching this with this entity, and I was shown a field of which was kind of multicolored flowers that were almost weed flowers with some thorns in it. And there was a white flower that was representation of my mother. And this white flower or had been like overlooked, like she was living this life and she was really like a pure, good soul amongst these, you know, just average kind of things. So that was kind of surprising to see that about my mother. I looked closely and my lips were moving again. I don't know what I was saying. I wasn't in pain, um, wasn't in any kind of distress. And she was there begging for for my life. She was, um, I don't know what exactly she was saying, but apparently they didn't have oxygen in ambulance back then in um, New Orleans, Louisiana, but my lips were blue and she was essentially begging them and they were just kind of blowing her off for lack of a better word. They, they didn't have what she wanted. And 
I saw that at this moment, if my if I would have died, it would have not been okay for her. She was doing such a good job, and this was everything um, that she could actually handle. And then I saw hands go towards an infant child, and it was me, and it was my mother's hands, and I could feel her exhaustion, and I could feel how tired she was. It was just so much love that you know she had to offer. So the being that I was with, I had a choice to go back to that life or turn around and go home where I had been before. And as I mentioned, we'll go again. And it was almost identical to what I had said. If you go into a movie theater and then you leave, like it was my choice. It was like I was watching a movie that I had somehow created. So because of my mother, there, there wasn't an option to not go back. The moment I thought I wanted to go back, I went back with this being and I mentioned, and again, there aren't words to describe it, but with my thoughts, like how fun this was to go see my sister, see these people, see my mom, just by the thoughts, like I was ne negotiating this space and that area by thinking. And that being said to me in a kind, gentle way, it wasn't these exact words, but it was guard your thoughts because that is how you know, your life will be like, be careful, you know, what you think. And he shared that with me because I just said how fun that was. And I said, I, I want to go back. And immediately it's like my thoughts brought me back there. So the next thing I remember, I was back into my body and it was incredible because I was laying in a bed as I was already at the hospital and I was looking straight up at the ceiling and the ceiling was so incredibly beautiful. <laughs> it was a beige ceiling and it had the crossbars, like metal crossbars that were slightly glossy and ceiling tiles that were also the same color, but they were matte and the contrast was incredible. And I didn't have the background noise yet that we have in life. You know, sometimes our thoughts just move as if we're watching a television, you know, they, or our thoughts flow and move as if we're watching a television and they kind of take up space. When I was watching that scene and feeling this, that was gone. I believe my mind was on the ground with that little girl and I was just pure, I was just pure energy. And my thoughts were so pure. You know, it wasn't convoluted or polluted by the, the thoughts that just run through our head all the time that we're kind of not even aware of. It just goes. So I went back to my body and I walked away from that. I remember seeing a mangled little girl. I had a big scar on my forehead and I walked away from that accident without a scratch. My brother was in a body cast for I don't know four months. He had so many broken legs and they were baffled about how I just didn't have any scratches. I honestly believe with the breath that brought me back into my body that I was, I was somehow healed, but I had essentially just an exterior scar on my forehead, but no, um, no injuries internally.